go ahead and get started. Um, so my name is Vic Chib. I'm an assistant professor in biomedical engineering and uh, I study decision making and decision making in humans. So in my lab we put people on an MRI scanner, we have them make choices and we model their choices with some mathematical modeling and their neural activity as well and we try and understand where and how the brain computes um, decisions. Uh, and so today what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about the basics of a technique that we use which is um, fMRI. Okay, so I'm not going to go into physics details of fMRI because I realize that a lot of you aren't going to use fMRI. But what I would like you guys to understand at the end of the lecture is when you're looking at a news story in the newspaper a lot of times we see images of um, brain data this thing doesn't work. Brain data that looks something like this with some pretty blobs, right? And um, I want you guys to just be able to understand sort of the limitations of that data and, and how they even got it, okay? So next time you read a New York Times story, you'll be able to know whether it's complete BS or if it's, uh, it's valid, okay? Um, so the way we get these images is we put people in a big scanner like this. This is an MRI scanner. Um, and the MRI scanner is basically a large magnet um, and there are uh, radio transmitters that allow you to perturb atom, atoms that are put in the magnetic field and a radio receiver that reads out radio waves that come back from those perturbed atoms. Okay? And that, that uh, the signals from that receiver are what give us the MRI signals that we look at in, in the pictures I just showed you. Okay? And so basically the magnetic uh, field of an MRI scanner is always on. There's a static magnetic field um, that is uh, measured in Tesla. And so to give you an idea of how strong a magnetic field there is in an MRI magnet, uh, a, refrigerator mag a refrigerator magnet is five milli Tesla, or f yeah, five, five milli Tesla, and the Earth's magnetic field is 31 micro Tesla, um, and the scanners that we use are three Tesla, seven Tesla. So at Hopkins we have a three, two 3T three magnets and one uh, 7T magnet, okay? So really strong magnetic fields. If you bring something within a couple feet of the magnet, it'll like fly into the magnet and get stuck to the magnet. This field is so strong that you need to quench the magnet, you need to sort of ramp down the magnetic field to be able to remove that thing, whatever it is, from the magnet, okay? So it's a really big magnetic field, okay? And, um, right, so it's a large magnet. Uh, wait, so I'm going the wrong way. All right, this thing isn't working. Um, and so the way, the way we, what we measure with um, MRI is, uh, is the magnetic uh, field that's returned from atoms within our body. So the way it works is nuclei of some atoms behave like small magnets. So you put people in the MRI scanner and those um, atoms then align to the magnetic field. Um, then you excite them with a radio frequency pulse. So you sort of perturb the atoms in that magnetic field after they've been regu regularized to the field. Um, and over time, once you turn off that pulse, they'll relax back to their, their resting position. And that relaxation is what we read out in the MRI scanner. So it's detected by, by um, a radio frequency detector. And the, the strength of the signals from those atoms depend on the chemical composition of, of what you're measuring, as well as the radio frequency pulses that you're exciting them with. Okay? So there are specifically specific radio frequency sequences that are designed to image certain types of tissue and certain elements within your tissue. Okay? And so basically this sort of illustrates the idea. When there's no magnetic field on, the atoms in your body are sort of randomly oriented. They spin um, and are aligned at random, random orientations. You get put in that huge magnetic field and they all, um, or a percentage of them, align in a certain direction, okay? Along, along the magnetic field, right? And then what you do with your radio frequency transmitter is you give a pulse, um, a radio frequency pulse, and that gets you to sort of shift from, from the alignment of the magnet. So you, you can think of the the, uh, the axis of the magnet along this B-naught arrow, and you perturb 
the atom with a, with a uh, magnetic field. It sort of moves off of B naught. And once you shut off that radio frequency pulse, it sort of oscillates and returns back to that, um, that initial position. And using your, your um, receiver, you're able to read out uh, the relaxation of that, that, those atoms. So, and that sort of is illustrated here. So basically, what, what you can think of these atoms as being like tops that are spinning, aligned to the magnetic field, you bump the top and it'll sort of oscillate back to its resting state. And that's what's sort of, that's what's gathered um, from the uh, receiver core, the, the relaxation of the atoms back to their, their steady state, okay? And so different biologic materials have different T1 and T2 characteristics, which are associated with those relaxations. So T1 and T2 correspond to the relaxation of, of, about, um, about uh, the magnetic field, okay? Does that kind of make sense, general idea of how it's working? Um, and yeah? Right, so, so, uh, so basically what's happening is you're, this atom is both spinning along this axis and spinning itself, right? So it's spinning along x, y, z. It's going to trace a path al around the z, the z axis, but it's also sort of tracing a line around here in the, in the x, y plane, right? So that's what you see here. It's sort of spinning back, back to where it's coming from, and then the the t the t two and the t one are basically the relaxations. Uh, oh, do I have it mislaid? Oh yes, that one is t one. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Okay. All right. So um, and then what you can do is you can set up you can vary the magnetic field along a certain area. So you can give your radio frequency pulses along a certain um, place along this entire magnet, and then you can image. Uh, tissue characteristics at that particular location, right? So if we want to look at brain images, we'll put our, our receiver coil uh, right where the brain is, okay? So um, a question that always comes up is, you know, what is the difference between MRI and fMRI, right? Are they different or are they the same? Use the same scanner to get fMRI and MRI um, images. Um, but MRI studies study brain anatomy and they use sequences that are sensitive to lipids or water um, within tissues, whereas functional magnetic resonance imaging um, looks at function, so more rapid things that are happening in, in your tissue and are specifically related to blood oxygenation, so the oxygen in your blood, okay? And so the way fMRI works is um, what, what's happening in your brain is that, you know, when you have some synaptic firing, um, it, it uh, signals a glutamate release, which then tells the brain to send oxygenated blood to a certain area, okay? And so when you're, when you're imaging the brain and when you're looking at fMRI signals, what you're looking at is the flow of that oxygenated blood. You're using sequences that are, that are sensitive to the flow of oxygenated blood, all right? So, with that in mind, are you directly imaging firing of neurons with MRI? Anybody? No, you're not. You're, you're imaging blood flow, right? We have a pretty good idea that blood flow is related to synaptic processes, so we sort of infer something about firing from that blood flow, but you're not directly imaging neurons. So you probably had Kathy Cullen and Ed Connor come in and talk about recording from neurons. Um, we're not doing that. We're using blood flow to make inferences about what's happening in neurons, okay? Um, and so just to go through it again um, more clearly, so syn synaptic transmission consumes energy and oxygen, which causes the release of, of glutamate, and the glutamate signals um, uh, the, the necessity for blood flow. Um, to compensate for, the, for that metabolism that's going on. This causes concentrated, co the concentration of oxygen um, in oxygenated hemoglobin in those areas to increase, and that's what we're imaging with, with our MRI signal, okay? So we're using sequences that are specifically tailored to be sensitive to oxygenated hemoglobin, okay? And so, um, the good thing about MRI is that you can acquire an image of the entire brain over um, one to four seconds, over one to four seconds. So, you know, when people 
do neurophysiology, they're recording from several ne neurons, um, which is a bit constraining because you're not able to look over the entire brain. Um, with MRI, you're able to look over the entire brain, but you don't have the same temporal resolution that somebody like Ed or Kathy would have when they're recording from a, a single neuron. Okay, so there's a trade-off between how quickly you can image and um, the the field with which you're imaging. Right. Um, it offers good spatial resolution um, for measuring neural activity over the entire brain, um, and it's a blood flow-based signal. So the idea being that as Neural activity increases, local blood flow increases um, associated with, the, the, uh, um, with metabolism, and that's what gives you the MRI signal, okay? And so, just to give you the, the, an idea of the temporal properties of the bold response, on the y-axis here, you see time, and on the x-axis, you see signal in, in a certain area. And what happens is, sometimes you might present an experimental stimulus. Um, what happens in the brain then is neurons fire very uh, shortly after, but if you look at the response from, um, from fMRI, it happens, the peak of that response actually has, happens five seconds later. So it's very temporarily delayed and very slow compared to the onset of really quick events, right? So it's not very good at picking up very fast happening um, changes in brain activity, okay? So peak bold response happens uh, very much delayed from the onset of, of um, your stimulus. And so um, there's some limitations to, uh, to MRI that are important to know because the, the bold signal is based on blood flow. The temporal resolution is limited to the precision of flow um, flow regulation, so a f only a couple hundred milliseconds precision you have in these hemodynamic response functions. And the spatial resolution is limited by the strength of the signal. So a 3T magnet, um, you're only going to be able to image about one millimeter um, voxels, so one millimeter volume elements. Um, and within that one millimeter voxel element, you have hundreds of thousands of neurons, right? So whereas people that are recording from neurons or like recording from single neurons, you're getting a, a measure of what hundreds of thousands of neurons are doing, right? Um, and you can't measure absolute amounts of um, activity or met metabolism. You have to always be control, um, comparing to control conditions, okay? Um, and the other thing to remember is, you know, we're looking at a hemodynamic response function, but that response function is different at different parts in, in the brain. So different parts in, in your brain have a peak hemodynamic response um, at different times. So what we commonly do in MRI analysis is assume a single he hemodynamic response function over the entire brain, but that actually isn't the, what's actually happening, okay? It's a big assumption. And so, as we said before, there are limitations. It's a population-based measure. It's, me it's measuring synaptic activity and not actual firing of neurons. Um, and there, you have coarse temporal resolution. And another issue is that um, easy to use and therefore it can be easy to misuse. Okay, so people tend to um, make a lot of mistakes when they're analyzing MRI data. Okay, so the idea behind experiments is basically to present um, stimuli to uh, subjects or have them perform a task and measure blood flow um, to find brain regions showing an increased activity to the stimulation or task compared to control. Okay, so um, and the, what you do then is you take your fMRI data um, and you take sort of one measurement for every voxel um, at, at basically every two to three seconds. And most analyses are based on performing large analysis of variance um, uh, regressions. And so we're, we'll go over that. And one of the limitations of that is multiple comparisons. So you have voxels, um, hundreds of voxels over your brain and you're making inferences about brain activity throughout those voxels, the, there are a large number of comparisons and that requires making multiple comparisons and having some um, assumptions in your statistics. So we'll, we're going to talk about that. So basically the idea is with an MRI scan, fMRI scan, you sort of get um, measures of brain activity throughout voxels over the entire brain and you can then generate 
bold time courses, so time courses and brain activity within those chunks that you've partitioned the brain into, right? You put that data in a general linear model, so why is your, your, your brain data, your time courses of activity and all those different voxels, and then you have different, um, different uh, events, basically different categorical conditions that are represented by betas which uh, characterize how the brain activity responds, basically the slope of the brain activity's response to different stimuli, okay? And using those betas from the general linear model, you can map them on to certain areas in the brain, okay? So you're taking, it's basically a big regression. You're just taking your three-dimensional volume of the brain, a time course in every, every voxel, putting it in a general linear model, and looking at how certain parts or certain voxels within that map activate and deactivate in, in relation to your task conditions, okay? And so, um, basically you can see here sort of the idea of, of, of the model. It's a simple linear regression, really. So you basically have your brain data, um, your explanatory variables, so like your regressors. So say you're having somebody do a task where they're doing finger tapping versus rest. One of these would be the finger tapping condition, the other would be sitting still. Um, and then you have um, parameters or regression slopes that sort of map on how much, um, how much variance is explained by these different conditions at the different time points in the experiment. Okay, and you're basically trying to look for the betas that, um, that how the betas are related to brain activity in the context of some different tasks, okay? Um, and so, as I said before, you basically have all of your, your brain data in a, in, a, in a big matrix, and you're just looking for betas over the different experimental conditions, okay? So basically, as each of these uh, elements corresponds to a sample of the brain through time, and you're looking at how your betas are related to the experimental conditions at each of those time points, okay? You average over all those betas, and then you map them onto the brain, and then you can look at how things are active in certain experimental conditions. And so this is an example of, of, a, of a basic experiment. So here, what they were trying to figure out is what parts of your brain are active when you're looking at different images. So they had one condition, which was, um, which was a control condition, which is, is uh, shown in uh, gray, which is basically just looking at a blank screen. Then another condition was looking at an intact object, which is this blue condition, um, represented in blue here. And then the dark gray condition is a scrambled object. So it's basically this same object, but it's been scrambled. So it's controlled in luminosity and image intensity and all these different, um, uh, different parameters. So that what they're gonna try and do is look at how brain activity is different when comparing between looking at objects versus scrambled objects or objects versus just a blank screen, okay? So what you can do is you can look at the time course of neural activity in certain areas, let's say visual cortex, um, and do a regression where one of these corresponds to um, the, the, uh, the onset of the, um, the objects, the other corresponds to the onset of the scrambled objects, and then you can do a subtraction between the betas associated with each of these to figure out what parts of the brain are more active when you're looking at um, objects versus the scrambled objects, right? And so that's what you see here. So um, what, the, uh, what you're looking at is whether a single predictor is significant compared to baseline. So here they've done an analysis where they've looked at intact objects versus baseline and you get a bunch of activity in visual cortex. But you can also do something more controlled where you're looking at a scrambled object, so it basically has all the similar visual um, characteristics of like intensity and luminosity, things like that, um, but it's been scrambled so it no longer holds on to, to the same properties of the actual object in the image. You can see there's like a more uh, refined area of the brain there, right? So basically this is obtained by just taking a subtraction of these different uh, betas, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So, 
the linear model, we know we, we try and do things that are operating in like a linear range. So like the stimuli that we give people are generally, so in the experiments in, our, in my lab, um, as an example, we offer people money to do different tasks, okay? And we know that your responses to uh, monetary incentives become nonlinear as they go, as, the, as those values of incentive get really large, right? So we always make sure that we're offering people incentives in the range in which they're linear, so at, at very low ranges. So that's actually a, a really good point, that the linear assumption is, is a big one. Does that answer your question? Um, so, uh, so I thought that it would be interesting to, after giving you just the basics of, of, uh, of fMRI studies, to just talk about um, how to critically evaluate fMRI studies. So there are a couple common mistakes that are made when, um, when people are interpreting their data. Even uh, neuroimaging researchers make these mistakes. And so one thing that's often done is people claim, people see some activity, so as an example, um, here's some activity in uh, visual cortex, and they say this area lights up, so region X is activated when subjects do Y, so when I look at faces, this area acts up, therefore um, this area is related to faces, okay? Um, but you need to sort of know what that brain activity is compared to. What are you comparing when you're getting that neural activity, right? So we mentioned that having your control condition is really important, and fMRI is based on subtractions between your task conditions and, uh, and your control conditions. So you need to ask the question, you know, what was their, what was their subtraction? What was the subtraction that was used? Um, and so, as I said, fMRI can only tell you about differences between conditions and not absolute activity. Um, and so you need to think about what the control condition is and about all the different things that could be happening in the test condition as compared to your control condition. Um, and usually you'll be able to think of a lot of different things. So we can go back to this MRI analysis that we saw before. So here you see this is, this is basically looking at those images compared to uh, a blank screen versus um, when you're looking at images compared to scrambled the same scrambled images, right? You can see a lot of brain activity is happening um, at the top when you're looking at a blank screen, right? So what are some of the things that could be happening when you're looking at this image that are not specifically related to the image? So your, your attention could be diverted any which way. If you're just looking at a black, blank screen, you could be imagining things, you could be making eye movements, right? And so that's why it's really important to have control and a very well thought out control to make those comparisons. Does that sort of make sense? Um, uh, right, so then an, another, another uh, common mistake that people make is, is the idea of uh, reverse inference. So people often make claims such as this, like when people do a mental task X, they activate region Y, which is known to be involved in the mental process Z. Therefore, X invokes process Z. So the common uh, example of this is people did a study where they had people watch someone else's pain and activate brain regions known to be involved in experiencing pain. Um, and when you have people also think about their previous romantic partners who they've broken up with, um, these same pain regions activate. So people say, oh, well, emotional pain um, is the same as physical pain, right? Um, but this is, uh, this is a, a type of reverse inference. So like you're making a judgment based on something you're not specifically testing, right? Um, so you need to sort of think about what the specificity of the activation of a certain region is um, to only be activated by Z. So to do that experiment, asking whether um, emotional pain is the same as physical pain, is actually really quite difficult because it's hard to generate conditions in the lab in which um, the emotional condition matches the uh, um, high and low emotional uh, negativity, let's say. So, and the other thing you need to ask is, is this really specifically the same region that's activated um, by, by, by the task? So you can see there are really big blobs here, 
right? And as we said, there are a lot of neurons that are activated in both this blob and this blob. And so you need to know whether they're actually the same neurons because the same neurons um, in a given area can do different things. And there's a, quite a bit of variability in what neurons in specific areas that are very close to each other um, do. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Um, actually, that's all I had. That's actually quite short. But uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. So next class, I was going to just talk about a study that we do in the lab where we use neuroimaging. But this is what I have for now. Questions, comments? If not, you can enjoy the day. Hey, man. All right.